Uh, I want to tell you a, a real quickly another a short story on myself. Uh, my wife and I love to play golf, and uh, this past week we went up to the Gray Eagle area to play the Dragon. And if and have anybody anybody here has ever played the Dragon, it's really it earns its name. It's a tough, tough course. And uh, we played a two-person scramble. Now, for those in golfers, you'll know what that is. And we shot one under par, so we felt pretty good about that. But I can tell you that that is some course. But uh, having played golf since I was a, a young man, I, uh, I'm a real stickler for the rules. And, and one of the things that really bothers me is people hitting into me or hitting into my group. And uh, sure enough, we were out on about hole number three, a fairly short par four, and Paula and I had reached it in two, and we were finished our putting and we were walking off the green when all of a sudden, here comes a ball flying off the tee box, bounces about 10 feet from us. And of course, I saw red for a second, turned around and went, four, back to the guys behind us. And kind of letting him know, that's a no-no, don't do that. Somebody could have got hit, right? Well, anyway. I told Paul, I says, next hole's a par three. We'll just pull over here and we'll wait for him and let him go through. We don't want him hitting into us again. So here they came. And they came up and they jumped out of the cart and they came running over together and they said, we're so sorry. I'm so sorry, he said. And his friend said, yeah, he should be. He's a priest. <laughs> <laughs> And I started to tell him that I wasn't a priest, but I was certainly willing to hear confession. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but he did apologize, and, uh, and it all worked out just fine. And uh, so anyway, uh, it's funny how God will work things out like that. But uh, anyway, we had a great time, and uh, our, my back is paying for it, though, this morning, to all that <laughs> twisting and so forth. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Father, we're so privileged to be here this morning. Thank you for this building you provided for us, Father, where it can be nice and cool when it's hot outside and warm when it's cold outside, Lord. We thank you for these comfortable chairs that you provided for us. We thank you, Father, for each person who's come here today. Truly, they are the church. We are the church, Father. And your Holy Spirit lives in each one of us, Father. And I'm just praying now that your Holy Spirit will come upon us this morning, come upon me. And as I speak, Father, that it will, uh, it will be just the words that Christ wants to speak through me, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you will anoint the hearers as well. And this will truly be a blessing for them, Father, a time of learning, a time of growing. In Jesus' name, amen. Two good friends, uh, John and Bill, uh, were walking back to their car after watching a Los Angeles uh, Dodgers San Francisco baseball game. Turning to Bill, John asked, do you think there's baseball in heaven? <laughs> Bill thinks about it for a minute and he replies, I don't know, but let's make a deal. If I die first, I'll come back and tell you if there's baseball in heaven. <laughs> and if you die first, you do the same, okay? They shake on it, and sadly, a few months later, poor Bill passes on. Soon afterwards, John is sitting on his couch at home watching a ball game, of course, on television when he hears a voice whisper, John, John. Responding, John asks, Bill, is that really you? Yes, it is, whispers Bill's ghost. John, still amazed, asks, so is there baseball in heaven, buddy? I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. John says, well, give me the good news first. Well, yes, there is baseball in heaven, Bill says. Beautiful, beautiful ballparks. That's great. He says, that's all I wanted to hear. What news could be bad enough to ruin that? Sighing deeply, Bill whispers, John, the bad news is that we have a big game on Friday and you are our starting pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny, isn't it? You know, that joke is funny, but it does illustrate a fact. And the fact is, is that everyone around the world has an interest in heaven. 
has an interest in what's going to happen after we, we die. Um, in his book, Eternity in, the Heart, Eternity in Their Heart, how many, any, anybody here ever read that book? It's a fantastic book. Don Richardson. Don Richardson says that anthropologists have discovered that people everywhere from every culture and civilization on the planet are fascinated with the afterlife and what happens to each of us after death. And you know he's right. Let's, uh, let's just briefly take a look at a few of the examples of people's different beliefs about where they go after they die. Job, the book of Job in the Bible is the old book in the Bible. Did you know that? It's the oldest book in the Bible. It, we think it dates back to about 500 years before Abraham or about a thousand years before Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And in chapter 14, verse 14, Job asked this question, if a man dies, will he live again? Good question. Everyone asks that question of themselves at one time or another in their life. And then he almost immediately answers his, his question by saying, all the days of my struggle, I will wait until my change comes. So he had this hope, this hope that he was going to, uh, um, that he was going to live again. Aborigines in Australia believed that when you died, you went to the land beyond the western horizon. It makes sense. Sun comes up in the east, sun goes down in the west. That must be where we go, right? The ancient Finns believed just the opposite, that when you died, you went to an island beyond the far east. Okay? Now, it's a globe, so maybe it's the same place, right? <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> the Aztecs and the Incas and the ancient Polynesians believed that when you died, you went to the sun or to the moon. Again, makes sense. They could see it. They couldn't get to it, but they figured a way to get to it was after they died. Ancient Greeks put coins, coins, on the deceased, on their eyes, on the eyes of the deceased, so that they would have money to pay Charon, the ferryman, to take them over the rivers Styx and Archeron that divided the world of the living from the world of the dead. So they want to make sure that their loved ones had those coins to pay that ferryman to take them over the river. And yes, I know we've all seen enough Western movies to know that uh, Native American Indians believe that when you died, you went to the happy hunting grounds, right? It's true. It's true. A few weeks ago, I ran across the story of a young African student uh, attending one of the seminaries here in the United States. He wrote something that I find intriguing. He said this, I have been in the United States for some time now, and I have seen the great wealth that is here, the luxurious homes, the new cars, the fine clothes. I've listened to many sermons in the churches here too, but I have not yet heard one sermon about heaven. It seems to me that it must be that because people here have so much that no one preaches about heaven. They do not seem to have a need for heaven here in the United States. In my country, most people have very little, so we preach about heaven all the time. We know how much we need it. John MacArthur said this, there seems to be a significant amount of indifference towards the glory of our future. There is minimal interest in what God has prepared for them who love him and a whole lot more preoccupation with how Jesus is supposed to fix life here and make it idyllic. Well, brothers and sisters, that's really not what the Bible promises at all. That is not what the Bible promises. Our great hope is ahead of us. And as Christians, we look forward to the, the, the glory of heaven that only heaven can provide. You see, all of this would seem to fly in the face of Colossians 
3, 2, where Paul told his listeners to set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. To set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Jesus put it another way. He said, the things that are highly esteemed by men are an abomination to the Lord. That should make you think, shouldn't it? So what is it that you esteem in this life? So what does it mean to set your mind on things above? Well, you could set your mind on prayer. Prayer, make sure you're spending time talking to God on a regular basis, communicating to him. Set your mind on reading and meditating God's word. That, again, is part of setting your mind on things above. Set your mind on fellowshipping with and serving the body of Christ. And that's what you're doing here this morning. You're here to fellowship, to hear God's word. <coughs> and many of you, if not most of you, are serving in some capacity or another. Set your mind on worshiping God and thanking, and thanking him for all that he has done on your behalf. You realize everything good that you have in your life, everything good that you have came from God. It's a gift from God. It tells us that in James. It says that uh, God's something God thought about. And he wanted you to have it and he gave it to you. So you should say thank you. Thank you. All good gifts come down from, from God. The glory of life. Since there's no shadow of turning. So say thank you. You know, say, when you give someone a gift, don't you like to hear the words thank you? I do. You don't have to hear it. And God doesn't have to hear it either, but he wants to hear it. The Apostle Paul gives us another way that we can set our mind on things above. In Philippians chapter 4, verses, verses 8 and 9, he instructs us as follows. Finally, brothers and sisters, some of you probably have this memorized. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, and whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See? There's a list for us right there. He says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. In another place, Paul tells us, let's see what's happened here. There we go. iPads are great when they work. <laughs> Paul's words to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You think about that, uh, it should also remind us to set our minds on things above and that our ultimate destination is heaven. So let me ask each of you this morning, what are you setting your minds on? And what do you find yourself thinking about day in and day out? Hopefully you're setting your mind on things above. You see, what we think about what will usually determine our direction in life. So what you think about is going to determine the direction that you take in life. And when our direction in life is following Jesus, then we can rest assured that heaven will be our final destination. Makes sense. Hand in glove. That being said, my purpose this morning is, is, uh, is to remind each of us that as Christians, we hold dual citizenship. How many of you know what dual citizenship is? All right. Winston Churchill had dual citizenship. You know why? Because his father was a British aristocrat and his mother was an American. So he had dual citizenship. And he had the benefits, enjoyed the benefits of both countries. It's kind of cool, huh? Now I, physically speaking, only have one citizenship and that's here in the United States. And I'm grateful for it and very thankful for the benefits that I have as a citizen of this country. But Paul tells us that we have dual citizenship in heaven. We are citizens of earth, but also citizens of heaven. Now, 
He didn't say you will be a citizen of heaven. He says you are a citizen of heaven. That's kind of cool. You have dual citizenship. So you live here in this world and you enjoy the earthly benefits that your citizenship as an American citizen gives you. And you also enjoy the benefits that you have as being a citizen of heaven. You see, looking forward to heaven and what it holds for us should have a dramatic impact on how we live our lives today while giving us the comfort, hope, and peace to face what lies ahead. So if you would, please open your Bibles to John chapter 14. This is one of the chapters that I have memorized. That's because it's so hopeful. It's so hopeful. But we're going to take a look at just the first three verses. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. As Jesus' time to suffer drew near, uh, his disciples were despairing over being told that he was going away and they could not come with him right now. He kept telling them that this has to happen and they kept trying not to believe it. In the midst of all this, Jesus begins to deal with their sorrow and grief by telling them what he has planned for them once he's accomplished everything that he came to do. He begins by saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I am going to prepare, prepare a place, I am going to, blah, 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 to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Look, he said, I'm going away. But while I'm gone, I'll be preparing a place for you. Now don't miss that phrase, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus was, was preparing a place just for you in heaven? And, uh, or were you just assuming that everyone's dwelling place would be the same? You know, like a bunch of condos or track homes in heaven, right? <laughs> I mean, if that's what it is, it is, right? But uh, I don't think so. I really don't think so. To put it another way, who knows you better than God? He created you. And when it comes to building a place for you in heaven, doesn't it just make sense that the one who created you and knows you better than anyone else, both your likes and your dislikes, that he would be in the best position to build a dwelling place ideally suited to you, a dwelling place that will be glorious while also retaining that special homey feeling that we all love. C.S. Lewis put it this way. I put this in for Jay. He likes to quote C.S. Lewis. <laughs> he said, that's heaven, a place both spacious and intimate. Your place in heaven will seem to have just been made for you and for you alone because you were made for it made for it, stitch by stitch, as a glove is made for a hand. It's pretty awesome, huh? You ever thought about that? Set your mind on things above? Looking back at our scriptures, next pay particular notice to Jesus' words that his Father's place has many rooms. Many rooms. To me, that indicates the heaven's not made only for me, but also for all of my Christian family and friends, past and present, whether on earth now or in heaven. So I have parents there, I have uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters who've preceded me in death, but they're now in heaven. And I'm looking forward to seeing them again. And you know, Jesus said he has lots of rooms in his father's house. And that's something that uh, I find to be comforting and to be reassuring. Now, some people may not, you know. 
think about that, you know, how to live with him or her for eternity, you know. It's a little poem, to dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, well, that's a different story, right? <laughs> no, we will all be perfect in heaven. We won't have any of this sin nature. And uh, you probably won't even recognize me. I'll be so improved, you know? <laughs> So, let's uh, look ahead now. Let's take a look at our heavenly city, the place where we're going to live for eternity. Uh, turn over to John, uh, Revelation chapter 21. I've got some st statistics to share with you this morning I think you'll find pretty, pretty interesting. John, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 21, John sets the stage for us in verse 1. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. This is the new heaven and the new earth. This is where you and I will spend eternity. It's cool, huh? And you know, I remember on my wedding day, how beautiful my bride was adorned. And you know, I was nervous, but when she came walking down that aisle, I just, whoa! She's so beautiful, so stunning. And you know, that's the way the church is described in the Bible. We are the bride of Christ. And we're going to be pure, and we're going to be clean, and no more sin in our lives. Beautifully prepared for our husband, Christ. It took me a long time to be okay with that, you know, <laughs> when I was a new Christian. But that's what the Bible teaches, doesn't it? Church is the bride of Christ. Now, let's jump all the way down to verse 15. In verse 15, the angel who had talked with me, that's John speaking. John says, the angel who had talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city as its, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square. As long as it was wide, he measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. That's quite a bit of detail, isn't it? I mean, this angel measured it and told you how big it was. It's pretty cool. Many translators render the term 12,000 stadia to equaling 15, about 1,500 miles. Now, to put that in perspective, that distance will be similar, similar to your driving from Sacramento to Oklahoma City. It's pretty good. We, we, just, we just drove it, so we know. <laughs> or it would be about the same as driving from Key West, I'm sorry, Augusta, Maine to Key West, Florida. Long ways, 1,500 miles. But wait, that's not all, because the city is not just 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles long. It's also 1,500 miles high. It's an immense cube. Now let's have a little fun with these numbers. Well, first of all, let's back up. I'm going to make a note here. It's interesting to note that the most holy place, you know, the tabernacle in the wilderness, and also the holy place in the temple, that uh, it was, uh, is the measurements for the holy of holies, the holy place was 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet high. Interesting. And that's where God dwells, you see. And that was obviously meant to serve as a type of our heavenly dwelling. Apparently God likes cubes. <laughs> he does. He liked them in the temple, he liked them in the tabernacle, and he likes them in the new, the new Jerusalem. Now let's have some fun with these numbers. I'd like to give you a sense of the uh, immensity of heaven and of our heavenly home. So, just so you won't feel too crowded, let's give you a home with, say, 12-foot ceilings. 
Good luck. See, that would give you a lot of room, right? You want not to practice in your flying through roofs and you won't bang your head. Except from your room, right? Do you realize that if each of the homes in the new Jerusalem had 12-foot ceilings, the new Jerusalem will be approximately 600,000 floors high. That's high. A lot of room. No need for stairs or elevators either. With your heavenly body, you can zip right through to the top. Up or down, or from side to side if you wish. You know how Jesus appeared in his new body? Did he walk through the door where the disciples were hiding? He just appeared in the room. Something different about our new bodies. So, new forms of transportation. You know, the other thing, in case you're feeling still a little bit crowded, 12-foot roof's not quite enough for you. Let's take a look, uh, hypothetically and in fun, how much space you could have in a city of that size. So you've got your dwelling place there with your 12-foot ceilings, and you're zipping up and around to the building. It's going to go over and see, uh, and go over and see Jaron. Hey, Jaron. Hey, Bob. How'd you get here so fast? Huh? No, okay. Anyway, hypothetically speaking, let's assume that there's 20 billion people resurrected bodies in heaven. That's a lot. There might probably be more. Might be less. I don't know. But just using that number, 20 billion, that means each of us would have about 75 acres. I don't have 75 acres now, do you? <laughs> and I don't have a, I do have 12 foot ceilings in my, uh, my living room, but this, uh, this sounds pretty good to me. Lots of room to spread out, but also have my friends so close that I can zip right over there and see them. So, you see it's an intimate dwelling place for you, but it's also immense. But there's something else that Jesus says back in John 14, verse 3, if you want to turn back there again. In John 14, verse 3, Jesus says something that I want to draw our attention to. He says this, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you back so that you will be with me that where I am, you may be also. You see, what really makes heaven is that Jesus is there. You're going to be friends with Jesus. You're his friend now. He calls you friends. Did you know that? We sing a song, he has called me friend. It's true. Jesus said, I no longer call you my disciples. I call you my friends. That's right. So you're going to be friends with Jesus. You're going to be able to go up and talk to Jesus. You're going to be able to fellowship with him. And that to me is exciting because he is the one who made it all possible for us. Remember that thief on the cross? Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. The apostle Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul reminds his readers that we will all be caught up in the air to meet the Lord, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Okay? So, Jesus will be there, and that should bring comfort to you too. In other words, you know, right now we hear about the Lord. You know, we hear what he says through the Bible. But we're going to be with him then. We don't have to hear about it. We can just ask him. He'll tell us. You see, one of the most beautiful things that John tells us is about, about heaven is that we will have an intimate relationship with Jesus. We will look on his face. It will be personal, up close and personal. And as we begin drawing towards a close this morning, not finished yet, but drawing close, 
I thought you might find it of interest to hear some of the things that will not be in heaven. Maybe you thought about this, but I found this very fascinating. This list is not exhaustive, but there's enough here to help us see what a wonderful place heaven will be and what a glorious future we will look forward to, we have to look forward to. So you're going to have a perfect body. You know, the spirits of just men made perfect, perfect spirit. No more sin. No more influence of sin on your life. No more making the wrong decision, saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. It's all going to be a thing of the past. So as a result, there'll be a lot of things we won't need in heaven, right? Steve uh, Lawson obviously thought about it for a while, a long time, and he wrote this. In heaven, there will be no funeral homes. Okay, that's good. No hospitals. No abortion clinics. No divorce courts. No brothels. No bankruptcy courts. No teen suicide. No pornography. No dial a porn. No psychiatric wards. No treatment centers. No AIDS. No cancer. No talk shows. <laughs> he must not like talk shows. No rape. No missing children. No drug problems. No drive-by shootings. No racial tension. No prejudice. There'll be no misunderstandings. No, no injustice. No depression. No hurtful words, no gossip, no hurt feelings, no worrying, no worries. We say that, no worries, right? So be true up there. Nothing to worry about. What would you worry about in heaven? <laughs> no emptiness, no child abuse, no wars, no financial worries, no emotional heartaches, no physical pain, no spiritual flatness, no relational divisions, no murders, and for some reason he says no casseroles. <laughs> <laughs> he must have had something about casseroles and talk shows. <laughs> he goes on, there will be no tears, no pain, no suffering, no separations, no starvation. No arguments, no accidents, no emergency rooms, no doctors, no nurses, no heart monitors, no rust, no perplexing questions, no false teachers, no financial shortages, no hurricanes, no earthquakes, no tornadoes, no bad habits, no decay, and no locks. Cool, huh? He said that we will never need to confess sin. We will never need to apologize again. We'll never need to straighten out a strained relationship. And we will never have to resist Satan again. Never have to resist temptation. Never. For we will be in heaven with our Lord. Have you thought about that? Come, Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. <laughs> If not, then it's time for you to remember that you were created for heaven. Did you know that? You were. You were created for heaven, and you've been instructed by our Lord to set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. I want to close this morning just by sharing a story with you that I think perfectly illustrates the Apostle Paul's words that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, about 20 years ago, Paula and I were the college and career leaders at Cool Community Church. 
And one of the men that we really became friends with, close friends with, was a gentleman by the name of uh, Lewis Gortney. Anyone here know Lewis? Lewis? Lewis went to be with the Lord a number of years ago. What a godly man he was. He came to Christ late in his life. He had been an 18-wheeler truck driver. But he came to know Christ, and the gift that the Holy Spirit gave to him to use was the gift of evangelism. And Lewis loved to tell people about Christ. He loved to share what Christ had done in his life. And he volunteered a lot of his time down at the chapels at the truck stops that they have down on the interstates. They had chapels for the, for the truck stoppers so that they have people in there that can pray with them and encourage them. Because these men and these women are away from their families a lot. And they have problems. And they can't always be there at home to take care of those problems because they've got to earn a living for their family. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of issues like that. And, and Lewis would work in those uh, chapels. He told me some really neat stories about people that came to Christ as a result of, of, the, of his, uh, his service there. But a uh, number of years uh, later, uh, Lewis uh, developed cancer and uh, got very, very sick. And uh, he knew that uh, he was not going to uh, probably survive. Uh, it's going to be time to go be with the Lord. And... Uh, it, so he ended up his last few days in the hospital, and uh, I sadly was not able to be with him because I was traveling. I was traveling a lot myself at that time, uh, flying out on Mondays and flying home on Thursdays or Fridays. But two of the young men that were in Paula and I's college and career class told me this this story, and I think you'll find it very encouraging. I know it's been encouraging to me. They said Lewis was laying in bed, and, and uh, Stuart and Stephen were there. These are two of my, the young men that were in my class, our class, were there with Lewis. And Lewis was on all of the breathing things, you know, the cyst is breathing and laying in bed and seemingly unconscious. And uh, Stuart said that he was reading the Bible to, to Lewis. And not knowing if Lewis was listening or what, but having faith that he could hear it. And so he's reading from the Bible, and Steve is sitting down at the foot of the bed, and they're both watching Lewis. And he's asleep, and he's laying back, and he hadn't, he hadn't spoken to anyone for days. When at the last minute, he sat bolt right up in his bed, Stuck his arm out and said, look, Jesus. And he took his last breath. And he passed into eternity with our Lord. Wow, huh? What a way to go. Wow. And you know, that's what waits for each of us. And you know, you should be assured by that. You should be comforted by that. And it should give you peace to know that when your struggle on this world is done, Jesus is going to be there to meet you and to welcome you into heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful promises that you give us in your word. Father, we just can't imagine what it's going to be like to be with you in eternity. Father, we thank you that you have made that promise for us and that your son is even now preparing a place for us. A place, Father, the Bible tells us has golden streets and the gates are made out of a single pearl where there's no sun and no moon because God himself is the light there. And the river of life, the tree of life is there, Father, and the river flows out of the throne of God. It says it's going to, the streets of gold, Father, are like transparent glass. And it's just hard for us to imagine that that's our destiny, Father. That's what we have in store, what we have to look forward to. So I pray, Lord, this morning that... Each of us will go from here remembering this, Father, remembering the story 
of Lewis. Look, Jesus. We give you thanks for all that you're going to do in the week ahead. We ask for protection upon your people. You'll bring us all back together safely here next week. In Jesus' name, amen.